So tonight we're going to talk about, um, you know, it's something that all of us deal with, something that all of us have dealt with, uh, we'll continue to deal with, you know, in our, in our lives and in these bodies that we have and, and the sin that are, you know, is inside of every, each and every one of us, right? So tonight we're going to talk about uh, God's name is holy. Is God's name, or God's name is holy and why it's holy. Uh, Exodus 27 uh, says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So like I said, this is an issue that, that, we've, that we've all dealt with, right? It's, uh, you know, it's, it, you start really digging into this, and the more I dug into this, the more I, I started learning, okay, what exactly it is, what is vain, right? What is taking the Lord's name in vain? You know, it's... Uh, you, you see the, the things, uh, you know, on, on social media, you see the things that, that we see out there. You see the people that, you know, they say the words OMG, you know, does that, is that taking the Lord's name in vain? You see people say, you know, jeesh, is that taking the Lord's name in vain? There's a lot of, there's a lot of things in there that, that depending on what the meaning behind it, when you use that, it could be construed as, as taking the Lord's name in vain. So we'll get into that in a little bit here of what that is and, and what, what those things are. But first we'll talk about why God's name is holy. Um, you know, we recognize that the Ten, Commandment, the Ten Commandments are God's moral laws, right? It's His eternal laws, the Ten Commandments. Um, they're essentially a summary of uh, 613 commandments found, commandments found in the Old Testament. Um, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God, right? That's the first four of the ten deal with our relationships with God. The last six commandments deal with our relationship with with one another. Okay, so these commandments, and we're going to dig into these a little bit more in there, but it's, um, you know, these are, these are moral laws. These are, you know, it's, it, these, are, are, was, these are not what are going to save us, right? These are, these are what's in God's heart. This is what he wants us to abide by is, is these commandments. So let me open this up in prayer. Uh, Father God, this evening, I just pray, God, that you hear that, that you allow us to hear your word, Lord, that, that we begin to listen and hear it, Lord, with our eyes and our ears, that they would be open so that we can hear and understand your word, Lord. We know that the commandments don't save us, but we do understand that the commandments as laws reveal your heart. I just pray, Lord, that, that we will be sensitive to, to the as believers, Lord, and to those who believe in you, God. Thank you for, for this evening, for, for giving us Jesus. Thank you for, for allowing Jesus to, to come and die on the cross for, for us, Lord, and to, to fulfill your plan, Lord, that you had to make us your children, Lord God. So, Lord, we just we open up uh, to this, this evening, Lord, and we ask that, that you speak through me, Lord, and, and have your word come out to to help all of us understand, Lord, exactly what, what your name and why your name is holy, Lord God. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, so some, some scripture that talks about uh, God's name is holy. So some scripture on this. Uh, Galatians 2, 16, 20, Paul says, knowing that a man is not justified by, by the works of of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is, there, is Christ, therefore, a minister of sin? Certainly not. Verse 18, For if, if I build again those things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. Verse 19, For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I live, I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And with life, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in, 
in the Son of God who loved and gave himself for me. Boy, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Paul makes it very clear that we are not saved by the law, right? We're not saved by the commandments. It's, it's our salvation. It's our relationship with Christ that, that saves us. Okay, another, another way of, uh, another spot in the Bible where they talk about this, and they, it's kind of the, the same thing, but it's another spot. In the New Testament, in Romans 6, 1, 7, uh, he says in this way, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin or continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or... Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into, Jesus, or into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5 goes on to say, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man who crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Amen. So as we, or as long as we are on this planet, we are going to deal with sin, right? That's, that's one thing that we all know. As long as we're here in this flesh and on this planet, we're going to deal with sin. His salvation is complete, but now we work, right? Now we've got to go out and, and we've got to live our lives, um, you know, we've got to be the light. We've got to be Christians. We've got to be Christ-like. Um, he says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for the grace, or five, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of, our, of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, least anyone should boast, or lest anyone should boast. Okay, you are a child of God because you believe in God and you believe in in God's plan. And as his plan was Jesus, Jesus came and he died on the cross for us. And then he says, it's not of works in verse 9. Least anyone should boast. We cannot be good enough for God. Amen? Amen. His righteousness is beyond comprehension, but Jesus, right? But Jesus, who died on the cross so that we don't have to be to be good enough for God, right? We, God loves us for, for how we are, and God loves us for, for loving him and, and, and trusting in his plan and following his plan. In verse 10, Paul makes it clear to us, for we are his, work and his workmanship. Do you know what that is? That's you. That's me. That's all of us, right? We are his workmanship. He's working on us. Some of us more than others, right? But he's working on us. The things that you are, do, or that you are going to hear this evening... He's working on on you with. The things that, that he's put in my heart to put on here, that's him working through through the study that I did to work on all of us. It's not condemnation, okay? It's education. So what we learn through Christ, what we learn through all of this stuff, it, it's not condemning us. It's not condemnation, right? It's teaching us. It's it's teaching us to work so that we can go out and we can and we can further that work. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk walk in them. We should produce good works 
that produce glory to God. Okay, back to Exodus 27. You shall not take, his name, take, take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Jesus was once asked, uh, talks about it in Matthew um, 22, 37, 22, 36, and 37. Jesus was one asked, once asked, which one of the laws is the greatest? Jesus did not give one of the ten, but actually gave something out of Deuteronomy. He says, when he was asked by a lawyer, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. That's what saves us, right? We need to think of how we live our lives and what we say. We represent Christ. You, we, those of us that call ourselves Christians, that those of us that call, call upon Christ as our, our saviors are called Christians. Do you know what this means? This means that we are, like I said earlier, we are Christ-like, right? It's, it's we are, um, we're at a different, at a different standard that we, that we need to, to make sure that we keep ourselves to, to not be that barrier between us and somebody else that's, that's learning who Christ is, right? Not pushing anybody away because of the things that we do or the way that things come out of our mouth, the way that we talk. Um, we are Christ-like. Every time we glorify God, God gets the glory. But every time his name is used in vain or we are caught in a sin, God is looked at at being humbled. That is what he's talking about. We need to, to use our minds and think about what we're doing. We must use our minds to serve the Lord. So what does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain? So although many people believe that, the Lord's, that taking the Lord's name in vain uh, refers to using his name as a swear word, um, there's, more, there's much, much more involved in it than just that. To understand the severity of taking the Lord's name in vain, we must first see the Lord's name for uh, his perspective as outlined in Scripture. Psalms 8.1, Psalms one. 111.9, tell us his name is holy and awesome, right? We sing these songs every week, how holy and how awesome our Lord God's name is. The Lord's prayer begins by addressing God with the phrase, hallowed be thy name. Because of the greatness of the name of God, any use of God's name that brings dishonor to him or on his character is using God's name in vain. So if we're not glorifying his name and we're bringing dishonor upon it, it's, it's using it in vain. So it's not just um, using it as a swear word. It's not just using it uh, as, as a filler word. You know, we've, we've all heard people use, use um, God's name or, or Jesus' name as, as filler words, as a derogatory or a... Um, just not thinking about what they're saying sometimes. And, and for those of us that, that really, really understand that and those of us that in this room that, that try really hard, have tried through our lives really hard not to do that, it hurts, right? It, it stings a little bit when you're around people that, that talk that way, right? And it's every time they say it or, or, you know, on a TV show, every time they hear it, right? There's that little sting, right? That, mm. So... The third of the Ten Commandments forbids taking and using the Lord's name in an irreverent, irreverent manner because that would indicate a lack of respect for God himself. A person who misuses God's name will not be held guiltless, right? That's what we just learned in Exodus 27. There's a larger sense in which people today take the Lord's name in vain. Those who, name, or those, who, those who name the name of Christ, who uh, pray on his name and who takes his name as a, part of their identif- or as a part of their identity, calling oneself a Christian, right? It's those of us that are Christians, 
but who deliberately and continuously disobey his commands are taking his name in vain. Right? People that, that they, they, they cry out to God in one moment, but then they live like Shane says, right? They go out and live a life of hell. And, you know, they come in here on Sunday, for example, or come into their church on Sunday and, and put on that face. You know, that's not using, you know, that's not using Christ's name to, to glorify him. That's, that's using Christ's name to, to put a curtain over top of their face and over top of them to, to, sh- to, to shadow who they really are. So that, that's, that's using the Lord's name in vain by doing things like that. Jesus Christ has been given the name above all names, which every knee shall bow. He explains that to us in Philippians 2, 9, and 10. And when we take the name of, and when we take the name of Christian upon ourselves, we must do so with the understanding of all that it signif- signif- signifies, all that it signifies, right? If, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, then we need to be Christians, Right? We need to be Christ-like. We need to strive. Are we going to have uh, uh, slip-ups? Are we going to make mistakes? Well, like we said earlier, we, these bodies are, are full of sin, right? We're, we're made into sin, and, and we're going to have sin in our, in our lives until we're no longer in, these, in this flesh. So, so, yeah, but we need to do everything we can to shine as, as Christians. Uh, if we profess to be Christian but act, think, and speak in a worldly or profane manner, we take his name in vain. When we misrepresent Christ, either intentionally or through ignorance of the the Christian faith, as proclaimed in Scripture, we take the Lord's name in vain. When we say we love him, but we do not do what he commands, Right? And it talks about that in Luke 6.46. We take his name in vain. We take his name in vain and are possibly identifying ourselves to be among those who call Christ or those identify ourselves to be among those whom Christ will say, I never knew you away from me in the day of our judgment. Nobody wants to be there, Right? right? It's, that's not, that's not what we want to do, you know, and we talked about it today during service. Shane preached about it this morning is, is just another day. Well, just another day is the day when Jesus comes back for all of us, right? It's not going to be, um, on the calendar as a special day, right? It's not a red letter day where, where all our government offices will be shut down waiting for it. It's going to be just another day when the skies open up and we hear the trumpets. Okay, so what do we do about it? Uh, a story that, that uh, for us, a story that, that, that I listened to, and I, I, I watched some, some stuff on this, and it really, really made me think of this, is in Taurus, it's an area in the southern mountains of Turkey, uh, there lives a certain type of a crane, you know, a crane, a bird, a crane. Um, it is said that this bird seems to cackle and make a lot of noise, both in the air and on the ground. The noise tends to draw the attention of the eagles, right? And, and eagles attack them as they're their prey. So over time, the crane has gained the experience and the maturity and understands that a little bit now. So a mature crane knows and they'll, they'll scoop large rocks into their mouths and they'll hold these large rocks in their mouths to keep their mouths from making noises. It shuts them up, Right? And, it's, and it prevents the, them from making the cackling noise, and it, it prevents the, the, the eagles from hearing them and attacking them. You know, I, I can tell you for me, do we not do the same? I, I know that, uh, you know, in my life, uh, I often found, found it a struggle to hold my tongue. You know, it's, uh, we use the phrase, talk like a sailor. Well, I was a sailor for 25 years, so I talk like a sailor. It's you know, without Christ in your heart, it, you don't know any better sometimes. Um, I would often find myself um, acting like a sailor and, and talking uh, openly. I learned that when I was going to have a discussion with somebody that I needed to be mindful about with my tongue, that, that I had to do things. So I would always bring bottles of water in with me. And when it was time to open up and start saying things that I shouldn't say, I would drink water. You know, so it's, it's kind of that same thing. We, we learn about ourselves and we learn how to 
to control our own tongues. You know, it's, um, it's difficult at times. It's difficult for everybody in here. You slam your finger with a hammer. You hit your, your thumb with a hammer, right? It, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. There, there's things that, that come from your past that are buried in there somewhere that come to your mind in a hurry, right? And it's, it's controlling those things and, and saying, get out of my mind. You know, it's, you know I, I don't need to be saying that. I don't need to be thinking that. Uh, for some, this can be very difficult, a very difficult task to do, but as we increase our relationship with Christ, it gets easier and easier to control our tongue and control our thoughts to ensure that we are praising God and not disrespecting him. Um, we talk about this, this next little verse, our comment that I put in here. We talk about this a lot in our grief share classes, but when you're going through your grief, you struggle. You struggle with, with bad thoughts, evil thoughts, right? Bad, bad things going through your head a lot of times. But the more you fill your thoughts with Christ, the less room inside your mind evil has to take root. You know, so it's kind of that, that same thing, right? If you struggle, if you struggle with, with your mouth and you struggle controlling um, your curse words, if you struggle uh, being able to, to glorify God in, in what you say and what you think, then start filling your mind a little bit more with Christ, right? right? Get into the Word. Get into the book. Um, make sure you're with the right people. That's, that's a big one. Um, for, for a large group of us that, uh, that come here on Sundays or that are in our men's group, um, we work around people. We work in, in a timber industry, right? We work in the mills. We work in the, the mechanic shops. We work in the trucks. Um, a, lot of, a lot of language goes out in those places, Right? So it's, it's understanding that and, and, and working through that stuff. But what about those? You know, what about the world? What about others around us? How do we deal with that? Um, it's too common today to hear people using God or Jesus' name as a curse, as a curse word in television shows and movies. Okay, the response of a Christian when that happened might be as simple as just turning off the TV set. That's simple, right? It's, it's uh, Tab and I will watch movies every now and then. If we haven't seen it before, we'll turn it on. And, you know, within the first 10 minutes or so, yeah, it's usually we know, okay, yeah, we're, it's I'm not going to listen to this for the next hour and a half, right. right? And we shut it off and we go to the next channel. We go to something else. So we have that. We have that ability to do that. And I think most of us probably do do that. But what about when it's your coworkers? Okay. Um, what about when it's, your family? What about when it's, it's somebody different? This requires a completely different approach. Can't just turn them off, right? The more you try to turn them off, the, the louder they get a lot of times. So when a friend or a coworker is using God's name as a curse word, we should understand the nature of the problem, okay? Look deeper into it. Profanity is not the root problem. It's the symptom of a deeper heart issue. Uh, if people know and fear God, they'll have respect for God's name. The need is for spiritual transformation in Christ, and that is what we should be, or we should be po or pointing people towards. So, you know, to, to stop somebody and say, hey, don't talk like that in front of me. Well, understand that they're talking that way for a reason. Right, and, it's, and, and, it, and it does, it stings and you don't want to listen to it, but there's other things that we can do to try to lead them to Christ, right? We can start with, I mean, the, the obvious, right, is when you hear, some, or when you hear people using uh, God's name in vain, pray silently for them, right? Pray for them. God's listening. He knows. He knows how we talk. He knows how they talk. God knows. Pray for them. If able, we can explain to them how it hurts, how it hurts us, to hear our Lord's name uh, used in, as prof profanity uh, in our conversation, we don't demand that people stop cursing, but we ask them to as a favor to us. You know, if you go at it uh, kindly, right, it's, you get more, what, bees with, with honey than you do lemons or something like that. Or, you know, if you go at it kindly and you get them to understand and you make them understand, look, it's, you know, my faith, when you talk like that, it it disrespects my Lord, and, and I really wish that you wouldn't do that. And, you know, for me, please do me a favor and not talk that way. Sometimes that'll work. Sometimes it won't. Like I said, sometimes that goes even further. I mean, it makes it even louder. 
Keep praying for him. Keep praying for him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 12 and 13 tells us as Christians, we must hold ourselves to a higher standard. There should be a standard we hold ourselves to that is different from the standard of unbelievers. We should not expect non-Christians, unbelievers, to be living to God's standards. Right? We've got to understand that. We've got to understand that if somebody doesn't understand who God is, they don't know any better. Okay? It's, it's not always that, uh, that they're just a, a foul mouth hooligan. It's they just don't know any better. Right? They don't know what, God, what, what God's standards are. They don't know what God, what God wants out of them because they don't know God yet. So that's our opportunity. Right? Let's, let's introduce them. Um, it shouldn't surprise us when they sin. Right? It's in their nature. It's in our nature. Only we've, we've, uh, we've, we've died, right? We've, we've died and, and been born again and, and understand what that means. So we try. We try very, very hard to, to not sin. But people that haven't been through that, people that, that haven't accepted Christ and haven't given that and, and been resurrected with Jesus through his resurrection don't understand that. And, and they, they have sin. We have a responsibility to be a light in the darkness. In Matthew 5.14, it discusses that. Uh, this doesn't mean that every time people say, oh my God, we tell them they're sinners. It does mean we look for appropriate opportunities to speak to them about their heart condition, their enslavement to sin, and how Jesus can save them. Often people around us, they know uh, that we are Christians. Um, they'll be more careful in their speech a lot of times. I know uh, I've got some, some close friends that I work with, and, and I know how they talk. I know uh, when usually when I walk in the room, the way they talk will change a little bit out of respect, right? Out of that respect of, okay, I know, I know Bill's a Christian, so I'm going to kind of watch what I say. I'll watch my, my tongue and not use... You know, some of, the, some of the words that they use all the time anyways. Um, some who normally use God's name as a curse word may even catch themselves and apologize when they do let it slip. Um, you know, I can, I can tell you, uh, you know, my, my family and, and, you know, my sister, for example, is, is not a, she's not a Christian, but when we go to my sister's house, She's uh, very good at watches what she says, is, and, and when she does let stuff slip, she'll, she'll continuously apologize for it. So it's, just, it's kind of funny how, how people know. They know if we're Christians, and they know the things that, that we don't want to listen to. And then there's, there's the other side of it, which, you know, she, her son is just the opposite. As soon as he sees that it, it bugs you a little bit, he'll go even deeper on it. So it's, you know, we've, we've got a, in my family, we've got a, a side on both of those, and boy, I just keep praying on both of them, so... Um, this is an example of believers being the salt of the earth or the salt of the world. And it may lead to deeper conversations about the reasons why they should not uh, use profanity in the name of, of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of what the study I came up on with, with using the Lord's name in vain of, of what it is and why, the God, why God's name is holy, you know, why it's reverent, why, it's, why it is something that we cherish and we protect Right? As Christians, we, we protect that and we try like crazy not to, to let ourselves fall into that, that trap of talking like that. Um, but really when it comes down to it, um, you know, some of the things I read up on were, you know, like I said, is uh, you know, using those, those short little catchphrases, catchphrases uh, oh my gosh, um, geez, those things. You know, it's, it's all dependent on how you're doing. If you're, if you're using that phrase in a way that you're not disrespecting Christ, you're not disrespecting God, then that's not using the, word, the Lord's name in vain. But if you're just throwing that around as a, a butt of a joke, if you're throwing that around as a, a filler word, you know, then that's not using that to glorify God in any way. And that's something we all need to work on, right? We need to work on not using those. Can I ask you a question? Sir, yes, sir. That's a, uh, 
That's a touchy, that's a, I shouldn't say touchy, but that's a, a controversial question, right? It's Shane and I have had this discussion, you know, it's through my studies, you know, I found that you can't lose your salvation. And I, I came to men's, night, men's group one night and, and I, I gave a message on this about once you're saved, you're always saved, you know, and then Shane and I talked about it. And he's like, well, yeah, but understand there's more to it than just that. If you read this scripture, you know, it may say something a little bit different. Or if you say, if you read this over here, you know, it gets into, well, were you actually saved? Were you, were you really saved before? Because if you were saved, would you go back out and, and live in, in a life of sin, right? Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. I mean, that's where you came from. I mean, mm-hmm. people come up to the altar because the way they're living isn't working. And, and we show them something a lot better. And we hope that they don't go back to that, right? We hope they don't go back to that life again. But unfortunately, oftentimes it does happen. So it's, it's uh, I don't have an answer for that because it is a, a pretty controversial one. Do you want to talk about yeah, that at all? Yeah, I have an answer for that. Yeah, I, I do believe that you can, that Yellow. You can lose your... Yellow wireless. That you, can, that you can lose your salvation. If you couldn't lose your salvation, there wouldn't be so much scripture about backsliding. Um, I dealt with people this morning at this very altar that had walked with the Lord and things came in and things got tough and, and some way or somehow they, they, they had walked with the Lord, but then things started happening in their life and they quit spending the time that they needed to with God and they walked away from God. And this morning, for whatever reason, through the preaching of the word, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, whatever it was, but it, it convicted them that they're not in a place that they need to be in serving the Lord, and they needed to come to the altar and repent and recommit their life to the Lord. If you have to recommit your life to the Lord, that means you're not committed to him. And if you're not committed to him, then we stand a chance of missing being able to go with him. Um, and so, you know, if we, if we do everything that the Bible says to do, then once you get saved, you're always saved. But we have to understand that the scripture says that sin separates us from God, whether you're a saved sinner or a sinner sinner. And so when we sin, we need to repent. Yes, we're covered by grace, but, but too many people, when, when you stand in that pulpit and you begin to preach, once I'm saved, I'm always saved, and, that, and, and there's, there's churches all across America right now that are mega churches, that they're, they're, they're preaching that, and they're not preaching, uh, they're not even talking about sin, um, because sin makes people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is, you have to, you have to, you have to confront your sin. Because if you just leave sin and let it be unchecked, then we don't have a hope. And we need to repent and we need to come back to the Lord. But like I, I was saying, if, if, we don't, if we don't every day, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, I repent daily. Every day, Paul said, I repent daily. I crucify my flesh daily. And if we would all do that, chances are we wouldn't need to recommit our life to the Lord. But the reality is that people all across America, all around the world, um, they give their life to the Lord. They go out in the world, and, and because they don't pray, they don't read the word, they don't fellowship, um, they get separated uh, from the, the, the fellowship of, the, of the, the family, and they become easy targets for the Lord. It, and the enemy, again, the enemy, uh, the word says that the enemy is going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for somebody that he can, that he can knock off their game. So yeah, long story short, yeah, I believe that, that uh, I, I don't believe, I did at one time, I, I did believe that once I commit, confessed Jesus that I was good to go, but I've, I've lived enough now to know that that that's not the case. Yeah. And sometimes also along with that, I know talking to some folks is, is the guilt, right? When you start sinning and you start going down that path, whether it be 
you know, going back to alcohol, going back to a drug, going back to whatever that sin is that you're battling with your life is the guilt falls in and it just drives you further and further away from, from Christ also, right? And then you, right. you start stepping away from the church. You start stepping away from the people of the church, your friends that are Christians, and it just pushes you further and further and the devil gets deeper and deeper grabs on you, right? Right. So I, I think that that's finding the way back out of that, right? And once you, once you do, then it's, it's just a matter of, of repenting and coming back and, and coming to, to, to Christ and saying, hey, I, I screwed up and please help me, bring me back. You know, I, I trust in you and I need to come out of this again and repent that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Drag him right along with you. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Good word, yeah. Yeah. point all right well let me close this out in prayer and uh we'll get whoop. i was going to share something my mom said one time when she was a kid her mom washed her mouth out with soap mm-hmm. <laughs> because she said piffle and she told her mom she says piffle's not a bad word and her mother says no but you meant it bad meaning behind what you say doesn't matter what you say it's the meaning behind it whether it's bad or not so true yeah very true yep okay lord god thank you so much lord thank you for this day lord thank you for the message this morning from from pastor shane lord thank you for for bringing this tonight lord just to to remind us lord remind us of of who we are and the standards that we need to to hold ourselves to as christians lord and to 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 the to controlling our thoughts and our mouths, Lord, and our, our tongues, Lord, and, and to understand that those around us, Lord, may or may not know that, that that standard is what it is, Lord. So to have that strength and that courage, Lord, just give that to us, Lord, to where we can go out and we can, and we can be around our family and our friends, Lord, and our fellow Christians, our fellow brothers and sisters, Lord, and just to, to help everybody to, to understand who you are, Lord, and bring them to you, Lord, and, and to not dwell so much on, on the words necessarily that they're using, Lord, but to understand that that, that our job is to, to bring them to you, Lord, and then through that, Lord, their words will get better, Lord, and their understanding of, of that standard, Lord, and understanding of, of what that means to use those words and what it does to us as believers, Lord, and to them, hopefully, as believers, Lord. So we just, we just love you, Lord, and we thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord. We, just, we pray that you watch over us this week, Lord, as, as we go about it, Lord, and just to bring us back here safely on, on Tuesday night for our grief share, Lord God, and for Wednesday on Wednesday night service, Lord. And we just, we thank you. We give you all the honor and and everything that you do for us, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.